Good afternoon. It's a very great pleasure to welcome everyone to Harvard Divinity School this afternoon for a conversation with activist, public theologian, and veteran of the civil rights movement, Ruby Nell Sales. During this bicentennial year, our community has sought to be in conversation with religious leaders and scholars whose witness has helped us imagine our work as a school for the next 100 years. Who better than Ruby Sales, whose life bridges the civil rights movement of the 1960s and current struggles for racial and economic justice to help us think together about the practice of spiritual activism and the moral, ethical, and religious leadership that the current moment demands of us. Reverend Sales, it's a joy and an honor to have you with us today. Thank you for coming. Your work as an activist, educator, and public theologian models the kind of integrated vocation that we aspire to here at HDS. Your steady witness since the 1960s to a vision of a just society challenges us to sharpen our own witness and deepen our commitment to educating leaders who share that vision. Over 50 years ago, you witnessed horrific events in Hainville, Alabama, around the murder of Jonathan Daniels and the sham white supremacist trial that followed. And you've devoted your life to the struggle for racial and economic justice before, during, and after those terrible events in 1965. We're greatly honored by your presence. We're very grateful to have you with us today, and we look forward to learning from you in the conversation uh, this afternoon. So it's now my pleasure to ask Carlene Griffiths Sekou, Black Lives Matter activist and third year MDiv student at HDS, to introduce our distinguished guest, Ruby Nell Sales. Carlene, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is my distinct privilege and honor in this moment to introduce Mama, Elder, Ruby Sales, who has graciously joined us today. She is a public theologian, historian, activist, social critic, and educator. Ruby Nell Sales looks at her work as a calling rather than a career. She answered the call to social justice as a teenager at Tuskegee Institute, where she joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, and worked on voter registration in Lowndes County, Alabama. Sales received a BA degree from Manhattanville college and attended graduate school at Princeton University. She received a Master's of Divinity degree from Episcopal Divinity School, where she was an Absalom Jones scholar. While there, she developed a reputation as a preacher and has preached at churches and cathedrals around the nation. After Divinity School, she founded and still directs a national nonprofit organization the Spirit House Project. As a social justice activist, Sales Works is cited in several books, journal articles, and films, such as Taylor Branch's At, Ta At Canaan's Edge, America in the King Years, 1965 to 1968, as well as Broken Ground, a film on race relations in the South. Dan Rather's American Dream segment and the newly released book, Blood Brother, Jonathan Daniels and His Sacrifice for Civil Rights by Rich and Sandra Neal Wallace. Sales is one of the founders of Sage Magazine, a scholarly journal on black women. As a social critic, Sales has published works in several journals, newspapers, and magazines and is a frequent guest on Sirius XM, Inside the Issues, with Dr. Wilmer Leon. During the summer of 216, Sales was a keynote speaker at a ga gathering of nationally renowned theologians to discuss public theology reimagined, 
This was hosted by and later broadcast on the NPR program On Being, Krista Tappet, Tippett. Sales has received numerous awards and honors. Now mind you, I, I, I did tell uh, Mama Sales that I'm going to read her entire <laughs> um, introduction. She, is, she has absolutely earned it and is worthy of being known for the work, for some of the work that she's accomplished. She was selected and honored as a veteran of hope by Vincent G. Harding in 2004 and taught a class with him at Morehouse College on after the march on Washington in 2012. She continues to write and observe on movement history. Sales became a national history maker in 2009. In August 2013, Sales was awarded the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference Living Legacies Civil Rights Recognition Award. In 2014, she was inducted into the Morehouse College Martin Luther King Jr. Board of Preachers and became a recipient of the Beautiful Are Their Feet Award from the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. In May 2015, Sales received an honorary doctorate from the Westchester University in Pennsylvania. Sales was honored with the National Martin Luther King Jr. Peace Award from the Fellowship of Re Reconciliation at their centennial celebration in November of 2015. An oral history of sales is housed in the Library of Congress, and she was selected as one of 50 African Americans from the Civil Rights Movement to be spotlighted in the new Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., which opened in September 2016. She has made the struggle for racial justice one of the centerpieces of her work through the Spirit House Project. Since 2017, she has worked to expose state-sanctioned deaths of African Americans by white police, security guards, and vigilantes by compiling a national database of these events. Offering spiritual, financial, and organizational support to families, and by exposing these activities through church and community meetings, forums, and press conferences around the nation. In 2014, she co-sponsored a teach-in, preach-in with the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. Eden Seminary and Christ the King Church in St. Louis, Missouri in response to the teaching in Philadelphia, which exposed the means and tools of oppression that plagues most communities of color. Recognizing a need to nurture hope that instills and resides in young people, as well as revive an intergenerational community and human compassion, in 2016, the Spirit House Project introduced Hope Zones, there are alternative learning spaces designed to strengthen the hope, courage, dignity, clarity, nonviolent persistence, and nonviolent persistence. Hope zones are sanctuary sites of learning, dignity, clarity, and nonviolent persistence. It is again an honor to welcome and present to you. Ruby Sales. Won't you join me in welcoming her? Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming out. Some of you have um, been hearing from Ruby Sales since Saturday at the conference at Boston University um, at Memorial Church yesterday and this morning in my class where she turned us inside out. So um, I'm so glad that more of our community are going to have this opportunity. Um, I first met Ruby Sales last summer when she was interviewing uh, with Krista Tippett for the On Being podcast. Um, I was invited up there. I don't know how I got so lucky, but 
um, we were invited, a group of theologians, to spend a day or two with Ruby Sales. And um, I just felt so challenged by her um, that I immediately started working on her to see if she would come be with us at Harvard. Um, it, a lot of us were white, the theologians. And um, at one point, Ruby looked at us and said, you white theologians, you always want to do black theology. <laughs> She said, we're, we're doing black theology, we're good. Um, but she said, who is doing theology for the opioid addicts and their families? Who's doing theology with and for um, the unemployed? And I knew I wasn't, um, but I heard that um, spoken to me. And um, since she's arrived in Boston on Saturday, I have felt similarly challenged as a teacher and as a minister as well um, by watching her do her work. Um, so what I hope is that everyone here today will leave this room feeling like your vocation as a scholar, a student, a teacher, a minister um, has been called out in some way that is going to be really fruitful to you, has been opened up in some way. Um, through your conversation with Ruby Sales. When I invited her to come to HDS, she said, I said, I want you to come give a lecture to HDS. And she said, I want to come to HDS, but I don't want to give a lecture. I want to be in conversation with people. I especially want to know what students are thinking, what they're doing, what they're worried about, how they feel this moment needs to be addressed, what kind of leaders they are trying to be. Um, and so Carlene and I have, have imagined this along with Ruby as a conversation. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions. Carlene is going to ask a few questions. We're going to let it, a conversation take shape and in the, invite everyone into it. Um, so that's our plan. Um, we've talked some, the three of us, about the kinds of questions that will evoke the kinds of things Ruby wants to talk about today. But I thought I would begin um, by asking a question I've asked her already in some other contexts since she's been with us, um, which has to do with the spiritual resources that she drew upon um, as a young woman growing up in the Jim Crow South, as a civil rights worker in Lowndes County, um, imprisoned, nearly killed, um, testifying in a trial where um, justice was not done, um, how she moved from that space of trauma um, into a lifetime of remaining on the front lines in the struggle for racial justice, for economic opportunity for all, for human dignity, and for a genuine democracy um, where, where everyone's dignity is protected and cherished. So Ruby, please. Well, hello everyone. <laughs> Once again, I'd like to thank Stephanie and Carlene and for everyone who has made this visit possible. And I'm deeply, deeply honored in this season, in this deep troubling in the American soul, to have an opportunity to come together and deepen our understanding and deepen our ability to interrogate not only the world around us, but who are we within the context of that world. So hopefully we will have a very vigorous conversation um, that will grow each of us and we will leave here differently than how we came in. Um, I grew up in the aura, in the, in the South, with a black community and black parents who were spiritual geniuses. They were spiritual geniuses because they created a counterculture that allowed the children within that counterculture to find hope and meaning in the arid and violent atmosphere of Southern apartheid. They were able to inculcate within us a message that dominated the empire message that we were nobody. I grew up thinking that I was somebody. As a matter of fact, I probably thought it too deeply. <laughs> um, and, and, and that was really important. So not only did they create a counterculture, 
but they created a counter narrative. And that, and, 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 and that counter narrative and that counter culture was deeply rooted in the work that began in the fields during enslavement. That they were a, it was it was talking to God about themselves and about the world. Because the empire Christianity that had been given to them said that not only were their lives irrelevant, but that they were second class people, that they didn't even belong to God that who they belonged to was the enslaver. So black people created a world that reaffirmed, that placed them alongside all other human beings. It, it reaffirmed for them that I might be enslaved, but I'm a child of God. That was over and against being told that you were a commodity, being told that you were property, because the minute you asserted that you were a child of God, that meant that you had all of the rights of creation. It meant that you were an inheritor, not only of the fruits of democracy. I've got a right, you've got a right, I've got a right to the tree of life. That song came out of enslavement. I've got shoes, you've got shoes, all God's children got shoes. When I get to heaven, going to put on my shoes, going to walk all over God's heaven. And here was the punchline. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> so it was full of critique. It was, it was a religion full of critique. And it was a way of talking back in the world and analyzing the world when you were forbidden to read and write. And deeply embedded in this theology that I grew up with, this black folk theology, which was God talk of ordinary people by ordinary people. It was, a, was an element of agape. I love everybody. I love everybody. I love everybody in my heart. Mm -hmm. You can't make me hate you. You can't make me hate you in my heart. What agency? What agency? to declare in the heart of enslavement that you were the controller of your internal life. I couldn't, I can't remove the shackles and you might be able to control how, when and how I pick cotton. You might be able to control my movement, but you don't get the opportunity to control my inner life. And not only that, despite everything, you're not going to compel me to be like you because I'm not gonna hate you because I've seen the consequence of hatred. Can you imagine what spiritual discipline, what genius that took to imagine that kind of God talk in a world where you were reduced to being two thirds of a human being and to being property? It also was a, a, a black folk theology predicated on justice. And for black people, justice was not just what, what we wanted to receive, it was mutual. It was right relations. It was not only how people treated us, but how we treated everyone. And built in that, as built in black theology that we grew up with, was you can't talk a whole lot about the world and never critique yourselves. That you have to always, always critique yourself as vigorously as you're critiquing the world. And within the modalities that, uh, that black people created within black folk theology were, were very important. Songs, hospitality in an inhospitable world. Hospitality gave black people access to upbuilding community. It was through hospitality that black people remain, maintained relationships and built community, songs, mm -hmm. prayers, and even how we exegeted biblical texts. The, and so our parents were able, their genius was not only that they were able to deal with the world where they were, were standing, but also imagine a world to, that they wanted to bring into being. And not only were they able to imagine that, but they were willing to work hard for that dream, 
for that vision when there was no evidence that it would ever bear fruit. But they kept on tilling generations. They kept on believing. They kept on praying. They kept on holding on. They kept on keeping their eyes on the prize. And it is out of that cough that I drew on that shaped my ability to be elastic, to on the one hand deal with the, the pain of the murder of Jonathan Daniels, but to deal with that pain without rancor, without bitterness, without anger. Because I understood that the weight that need, that, that was not my weight to carry. That it was, I was not going to carry the weight of Tom Coleman's hate. I simply was not going to do it. To focus on Tom Coleman would have made him my significant other, and he was not my significant other. And so I was not going to be victim where for the rest of my life I carried Tom Coleman in the center of my universe. So I had to figure out a way of deep gratitude and the recognition <laughs> of what Jonathan had done to save my life without being enraged and in a constant state of anger and self-righteousness about Tom Coleman. And I say that I was able to do that because of black folk theology and agape and forgiveness. Thank you. Last week before Ruby came up to Boston for the various conferences and, and gatherings she's been a part of, um, she was at Riverside Church with Michelle Alexander and they were leading a conversation about uh, Martin Luther King's famous Beyond Vietnam sermon. It's uh, his lecture, which is 50 years um, old, and was given in Riverside Church. And when Carlene and I asked Ruby this morning, what's on your mind today? What, where should we go today with this conversation? She said, I want to talk about Beyond Vietnam, and I want to talk about King's Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, which I know some of you in the, in the religions and the practice of peace group read shortly after the election. Um, I, wanna, I wanna talk about those two texts as resources that help us <coughs> diagnose the spiritual dimensions of our current situation um, and lead a way forward. So Ruby, I wanna give you an opportunity to do that. Many of you here obviously are under 50 years old, much under 50 years old. How many of you, however, have read the v Beyond Vietnam Sermon? Okay, good. I say, people say speech, but it is not a speech because in the sermon he says, yes, I've done civil rights, that's true, but I come to you in this edifice as a preacher. So he makes it very clear, his starting point for the sermon. And I think that at the heart of the sermon is a continuation of the question that he raised in the Birmingham jail, which is a very important social theological question. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Beyond Vietnam asks the same question. Where do we, what have we learned? Do we, do we come together as a community or do we continue the chaos of fragmentation and containment? Or do we allow the mobility that is implicit in the promise that God offers to each of us to be able to flow freely in, in God's creation? And I think that Martin Luther King, it was a call to community. It was, he was asking us to do two things to really interrogate our assumption, first of all, about order and chaos. We tend to think of law and order. We tend to think of the environment as being, representing order, but really it's the ultimate state of chaos. Where there is injustice, where there is a fragmentation, where there is containment, where there is violence, state-sanctioned violence, that is not order, that's chaos. 
we can look at what happened with Moses in the Exodus story. Moses, with the commandments, he's bringing chaos, I mean order, to a chaotic world that they have in, inherited in terms of empire world. So first of all, Martin Luther King is asking us to deeply interrogate our assumptions about chaos and order. And what he's really saying is to, to replicate the values and the practices of empire is to descend in chaos. Or will we choose another alternative that has to do with a higher level of consciousness where we're able to perceive the particularity as well as the universality, where we can stand both above and plant our feet within reality. And I think people miss that point. And so I think that Martin Luther King, first and foremost, was also indicting Western materialism and the commodification and the dehumanization of people. He talks about a society that's predicated, that a thing society. And, and by, by what he's talking about, when you reduce people to, to when, you, when you're able to commit genocide of Native American people and take their land and come up with an ideological and a, relig a spiritual rationale where they are not human, they are only objects of your desires, where you eradicate all aspects of their humanities and reduce them to things to be done away with. Martin Luther King says that either the West is going to solve that and come face to face with this excessive material view of the world or it's going to descend into a spiritual death. And I believe that we are looking at a West that is shame stoking, that's in critical condition and is shame stoking. And it, it seems to me that the role of ministers and the role of theologians is to breathe new life into a dying and decadent society. I was thinking, today in a conversation that I had with some students that really socialization ritualizes ideological practices. So when you look at white supremacy, people are engaged in, in a ritual and practices <coughs> that undergird and perpetuate white supremacy. Without the rituals, it will not perpetuate itself. People are trained. People are not born racist. They're trained to be racist. People are not born misogynist. They're trained to be misogynist. People are not born to be heterosexist. We're, we're ritualized into those isms. And so I think that we have to really, th this is basically what King is telling us. He's predicting that the West with materialism, militarism, and racism, and I would add two more isms to that, is going to choke itself to death unless it goes up for some different kind of air. And he also talks about, let me tell you how we disconnect from reality. He talks about the chemical warfare, napalm, against the Vietnamese people. And we look at that and we are horrified, as we are horrified about the chemical warfare against the children in Syria. We are horrified, is that not correct? Yes. It's a horrible reality, right? <clears throat> But what about the chemical warfare, the state-sanctioned chemical warfare in Flint, Michigan, and Selma, Alabama, where the state-sanctioned lead is in the water of the children and the older people, and it, and it creates severe biological consequences? Why aren't we horrified? Why don't we call that chemical warfare? What is the disconnect? 
So Martin Luther King is calling upon us to, what is the, we talk about militarization and we look at Syria, but this country has been militarized all the way back to slave patrols. State sanctioned murder is militarization. And so we've got to start, see what I think this society does is that it allows people to have escape valves away from the reality of the history that they participate in and the history that they continue to create. And I was talking with, with Stephanie this morning, and I think what power does, it forces people to coddle people in power, to, to, to put their sensibilities above the lived experience of other people who they're offending. So I think that we've got to really begin to look at this. You know, when we demand that black people cause systemic racism, insensitivity, what you're asking black people to do <coughs> is to totally eradicate the systemic dimensions of their lives so that you can feel comfortable. Same thing when men ask women to do that. So we've got to, theologians and, and students of religion must have the courage to create a counterculture. You must have the courage not to call racism privilege, not to think that I want, I'm privileged as a black woman compared to many black women. So privilege, then you confuse the issue because then when the white person comes along who's living in Appalachia says, says that I have more privilege than they do in that way, they're absolutely right. So the question is not privilege, it's rights. Who has access to rights? That's really the conversation. So we need to create a language that builds on what we've learned, that takes the sermon that Martin Luther King preached in his prophetic nation, nature and look at the ways in which the right wing for 40 years have appropriated freedom-loving language to apply it to the most insidious and disastrous deed. Having done that, we need a new language because the language now has become poison. And so poison with right wing practices, de calling death squads freedom fighters, family values when you go over and against everything that families stand for, double talk, double speak. This is your job to uncover all of that, not to repeat it not to internalize it, but to interrogate it and to shatter it and to come up with something that will please, that will make me smile. <laughs> <laughs> How do we interrupt those rituals of white supremacy? How do we put a stick in the spoke? First of all, I think one cannot interrupt any ritual unless you recognize that you're participating in rituals. And it all goes back to telling the truth, having the courage to tell the truth, even about yourself. I often tell the story about my elitism. I mean, I thought I was doing everything right. I thought I had it all together until I had a meeting in Washington, D.C. With, with black women from public housing. And I said some things that horrified them, and they said that you got, you got class issues. And I was horrified. I could, and you know, I, I couldn't believe, and, and, and then I thought about it, and I thought, yes, you're right. That's the master in me that I've got to work to rid myself <coughs> of. So you have to be, and I didn't say, oh, well, I don't have class in me. I mean, you know, you know, none of that, you know, none of that, because to do that was to denigrate their experience, was to ask them to accommodate my sensibilities at the risk of, of giving up their voice and giving up and, and not claiming their lives. So we have to begin to, in order to break the ritual, we have to stop lying. That's the first thing, is to stop lying. Stop lying about American history. Stop lying about who black people are and deal with today that black elites 
are very different than who black people were uh, in the pre-integration who had an education. We've got to start telling the truth. And so I think that's the first way, Stephanie, that you, and then I think what you also do, once having realized that you're engaged in, in death-driven rituals, then you have to search the literature, search the scriptures for, mo for models, for, for resources that you can ritualize that helps you redeem yourself from the, bag from the weight of those rituals. But in every culture, there are these resources, whether you're talking about the abolitionist movement, which is my favorite group, because they, talk, they incorporate moral and ethical issues within a religious framework. And so I think that if I were a white person, I would look for a deviant history, the history that deviates from the empire. And that's where I would draw my definition of myself rather than for, to define my identity from the cloth and the fabric of empire history. Nobody is without that. Everybody has that good train running, tracks running through their history. The problem is we're not socialized to ride on that track. We're socialized to ride on the other track, and ride on the other track, and people are told that that's, that is who they are without understanding that everyone has the spirit of the abolitionists inside of them. And they have to locate that. That's the road to redemption and resurrection. I want to jump in on this idea of the nation state America as America has imagined itself. And you've so eloquently captured a, a snapshot of the history as being a disconnect between reality and the imaginary of who uh, and what this country are, having been founded on, on genocide and um, uh, the enslavement of, of, of human beings and seeing multiple iterations of what we now seem to be awakened, some of us awakened to others of us have been contending with it for generations, um, but that fascism and the, 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 the worst of what it means perhaps to um, represent humanity is captured before our very eyes and exposing, um, it's, it's not new, exposing what has always been there. Um, when we talk about this ritualization, it, it, is, it is even, it, it, it's captured within the fabric of our day-to-day -day existence from institutions to our government systems to uh, cultural hegemony um, yes. to the capitalistic both, you know, within the US, global interlocking uh, hegemonic systems that is held in place um, by, I think, a trinity of things, right? Capitalism, militarization, militarism, and um, in, 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 in many sense, um, religion uh, has played a part of that. We talked about this history um, located here um, earlier. The movement for black lives and others, um, Standing Rock, uh, you know, Not One More, Dream Defenders, there have been multiple uh, social movements and modern um, uh, uh, social movements that have been attempting to disrupt the ritualization of the dehumanization of the most vulnerable within the U.S. So when the movement for black lives disrupt the day-to-day -day travel and going in and out along your business when black men, women, trans, um, non-gender conforming, indigenous people are being mutilated, socioeconomically are being caged, right? Um, it is a disruption of this, the, the rituals that um, essentially, that, that, that we're talking about. It's this white supremacist imaginary that closes itself off 
from the reality of the truth about who we are. That said, one of the things we have been wrestling and struggling with he, uh, here, and I think many um, uh, among us, is what does it mean in this moment to be moral, ethical, if not prophetic leaders, and if you choose the route of being a prophetic leader, would you say what that means? Many have referred to you as a prophetic leader, but what does that mean? What does that call us to do in this moment, given the realities? I think in order to be a prophetic leader, one has to have what I call foresight. Mm -hmm. Hindsight, insight, foresight, and metasight. I, I think that one has to be able to be really realistically critical, but with hope and anticipation about the world that you live in today, but also the ability to imagine a new world coming. And that to me involves the ability to, that's, crea that's the ability to imagine is to participate in creating. And so I think that you have to, in order to have any element of a prophetic nature, it's not just sitting back and, and thinking about all of this. It's also understanding that as being the essential part of, of creation. The imagination is indeed a part of creation. So I think those aspects are very, but I do get a little nervous with the way in which we trivialize what it means to be prophetic. I mean, I can have profound insight, but that doesn't mean I'm prophetic. So we have to begin to ask ourselves, what do we mean when we say prophetic? Um, I certainly think I have great insight, but I don't think I'm prophetic. That's just how I see myself. I think that Martin Luther King, Fannie Lou Hamer, those were the prophets of, our, of my generation. Because I think what they've had that I did not have, I had not deepened my spirituality and my understanding of religious texts the universality of religious text, sacred text, in the way that they had. So I was bound by a kind of tribalism that they had transcended. You can't be a prophet without the ability to stand in a spot but yet transcend that spot. And, and that's what I think it means to be a prophet. Thank you. You mentioned uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and um we talked about the, the, the current moment in terms of, of, of social movement in multiple forms that um, the founders of the movement for the Black Lives Matter hashtag and the Black Lives Matter network, um, which falls under the umbrella of the movement for black lives, one um, dimension of it, one organization of it nonetheless, was founded by black queer um, women. Um, and the movement is essentially one of poor working class um, youth uh, and tries to um, model an imaginary but, but, but deeply embedded within it um, something that, that has not really been um, captured, I think, to the extent that it is. Would you talk a little bit about the submersion often of, of, of marginal identities, including identities of women? We talked about earlier having a conversation about, about women and the role of women and in a historical trajectory, but certainly what that means for us now. We saw that the Women's March brought um, multiple thousands of women uh, because in this moment, a broader cross-section of, of, of women and women-loving folk came and, and felt an imminent threat 
Um, and also, you know, we can go back to the civil rights movement. Women have always played a critical and crucial role, though not as, as visible or accredited um, as it has been. So could you talk about the role of women um, in our current moment? That's a very difficult question since the community of women is not a monolith. And so I think that given the nature, the very existence that black women inherited during enslavement, where we were used like women and worked like men, creates a whole different actualization of womanhood. When you are made to be at the height of womanhood and people create a cult around you that dehumanizes you in many ways and objectifies you and use you for the mission of the state, that creates a whole other understand a whole other issue. So what we have to do is to weave through that and find the gender universality as well as the particularity when we talk about the role of women. I think that black women, because we occupied this maleness <laughs> as well as this femaleness in terms of what it meant to be woman, has always, have always been on the front line of being, of doing both male and female things. And what that means is leadership. That the understanding of leadership, despite the fact of how it was, how it was articulated within the broader world, that black women played a central role in that leadership. Um, black women were aggressive um, we were not expected to be wilting flowers. We, ha we were expected to, black women were sent to college in the early 1900s over black men because our mothers did not want us to have to work in houses where white men would rape us. So you're talking about different dynamics being developed. And, and, and I think that where the common thing that we share to be a woman is to have less crust of the patriarchy embedded in our psychics. Mm -hmm. And it is from that lack of crustiness that we're able to imagine and work for a different world. But the degree, to the, but, but the ethnicity really mm -hmm. takes, makes it it diverges, I mean, there's a divergence that happens because white women do not live the same lives as black women. And so, and, and black women do not live the same lives as Asian women. And so I think that what we are challenged to do, but having said this, I do believe that women have a special role to play in redeeming the souls of America mm -hmm. because we're not men. And so I think that's important. But I, I do think it dishonors our work when we make women a monolith. And then this whole thing about, see, the only reason why marginality, see, I, I don't like the stagnation of the term marginality, because it means that you're seeing the world through one eye, that you're seeing the world through an empire eye, where economically and socially, you are marginalized within the construct of the empire. But what about the counterculture that I've said existed? And you're not marginalized in relationship to each other. You're essential. So how do we deal with that tension? How do we create a paradigm that does not reduce my condition to an absolute state of marginality, that then does not honor or, or recognize that I live in a whole other world that is beyond what the empire has given me. And that world is just as important to me as, as the empire world is. So I think that these are the kind of, and in terms of Black Lives Matter, I'm not sure Black Lives Matter, I see it as part of a trajectory and not as something new. Because the assertion that black people have made throughout history 
whether it was the NAACP through its legal advocacy, whether it was SCLC through its spiritual advocacy. At the heart of all of that was the assertion, Black Lives Matter, in a world that said that Black Lives did not matter. If you understand the historical presence of Black people in this country, and the intersectionality between the literature and the, soci and the, 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 the interdisciplinary meaning of Black Lives Matter, then you understand it's a continuation and not a disconnect. Despite the fact that people talk about intergenerational differences, every generation has differences, but despite that, I sort of chuckle sometimes that these children are continuing what we began, and it's not a disconnect, it's a continuation. I, I do want to, just to, to, to wrap, uh, clarif not clarify, but trouble this a little. Okay, perhaps trouble not. the water. <laughs> trouble the well, water. The, the, the only thing that I, because we're not operating within gender binaries, right? And, and one of the, 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 the part of, my question was, given that there is a multiplicity of identities now that have been historically erased, submerged, denied, we have folk who are non-gender conforming, we have transgendered um, persons and family members who are also disproportionately impacted by some of the, 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 the systems that we're The problem about. with that, the real problem with that, you see, this is the inherent paradox that although people say that they're gender non-conforming, when they present themselves, they present themselves from one of those two genders. So in many ways, you're shifting genders, but it conforms to our notion of gender. You become, you move from being a woman to a man, a man to a woman, and, and so that, I, that is a sense of, that is the real Marcusean paradox, that even when we think we're, we're protesting and doing something new, in many ways, we replicate much of the old. And so the, I, I think that I, I hear what you're saying, but I want to push back a little bit. Because as I imagine transgender, I want to see something that I've never seen before. I don't want to see the characteristics of maleness or femaleness. I want to see something that is a little bit new and, and unique. And then I, I said this this morning, and people don't want to hear this, but I feel the need to say it out of the preservation of, of race. If, you can tr if gender is fluid and elastic, then is race fluid? Can one transcend race? Logically, philosophically, one would be correct to argue that if race is, if gender is a social construct and race is a social construct, and one can transcend one construct, can one not transcend the other construct? And if so, why not? And does history matter? See, the fundamental question is, does history matter? And if history matters, can you have a reality that is both fluid and historical at the same time? That's really the new paradigm. Not to create a paradigm that is either or, but to really recognize fluidity within the context of history. And both of those processes are dynamic. But it, do we have a collective consciousness? Is there something called a collective consciousness? Can one transcend a collective consciousness? Can one transcend the marks of history? Can one transcend that which I have experienced? And if so, how do we do that? And what does that really mean? And, if, and, and so are we moving towards a world where I can be white and you can be black? These are logical questions that have nothing to do with whether I believe people can be transgender or not. It's not a value statement. It's a logical outgrowth of the question of social constructs. And so you have to tell me in a logical way why you can transcend gender, transcend gender and you can't transcend race. It's not a question of indictment. It's a thought question. 
I would say, and I, I know that we're going to open up for questions, and there's a lot here that we can continue to talk about. But continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but the thing that I, I, I am still sticking with um, and, 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 and will say is in as much as I would not want someone to define who I am regardless of where that is within the historical trajectory. You don't want to be defined as a black person. No, no I don't you, want You do not want to be defined as being from the African diaspora? No. Or do you want to be defined when you want to be defined? Or do you, I mean, let's, let's be clear about that. Well, we can't have it both ways. Either we have definitions and identities or we don't. I'm not saying I don't have one. I'm saying that I re retain my voice and my capacity to articulate and live into that. So you can be a European give. American. You if, can, if you decide that you don't want to be a black American, do you have the option of being a European American? I'm not saying that I'm trying to transcend no, no, no. who I, I am. I, I, no, I'm no, saying no, no, no. whatever I'm it is that I claim to be as no, a as but an I'm immigrant saying that, black no, you woman. You don't get that flexibility. You don't just decide whatever. <laughs> that's so individualistic. That's separate yourself from the collective experience. You don't have the option to just decide what you want to be because that's what you want to be. Now, either you've got an identity, because you can't say that on the one hand and then jump up and down about bearing the marks of racism. But I'm not saying I'm divesting myself from the identity of the collective from where I've come. What That's are you not, saying? I'm, I'm, not you're, I'm not saying any of that. What are All you saying? I'm saying is whatever my narrative is, that I retain the right to articulate that without someone imposing on me what that might be. I, that, I I'm disagree not saying it doesn't with that. Come I don't have collective. the right to do that without acknowledging what William E. Du Bois has said. I don't have the right to do that without acknowledging what Mary Church Sorrell has said. It's not, it doesn't, the conversation doesn't begin and end with Ruby Sales. Part of being, of a, of a collective experience means that you have historical voices in your head. And that these are the voices that you draw from. Otherwise, you're existing in a narcissistic, self-centered <coughs> reality that is devoid of history. And so I think we have to really, when I come before you, I'm not choosing to speak principally as Ruby Sales. I'm speaking as my mama, I'm speaking as my daddy, I'm speaking as Mary Church Terrell, I'm even speaking as Kwok Pilon, who taught me at EDS. I have lots of voices in my head, and it's those voices that become the part of who I am in the world. And the problem is when we become disconnected from those voices, we're unrelated, we're fragmented. And, and this is why I asked the question, does history matter? Because we believe that life begins and ends with our choices about what we want to do. And that's the highest form of individualism. And so I'm saying to you, I, I hear what you're saying, Carlene, but I want to challenge you a little bit because <laughs> you quote sources so well and you're so bright. And every time you open your mouth, you're quoting a source. And so obviously, You've got these voices in your head who are speaking and you're channeling those voices. And that's what makes you a valuable scholar, your ability to, to move beyond, to be able to enter into conversations beyond time and space. Well, if I can say, I, I, am, I, I'm not disagreeing with what you've said and I'm not sure that you actually understand heard me. I wasn't saying any of the things that, 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 that you You said that nobody has a right to tell you how to I was speaking in terms of transgendered identity. That was the sole yes, point. Yes, but that's and the problem. So the you get in trouble when you make transgender. queer and transgendered people. That, that was my sole but, focus. But queer, queer and transgendered people are not at the center of reality. We have to consider other realities. They're not the only one who get to determine, who have the right to determine who they are. Black people have the right to determine who we are. Women have the right. So that gets to be a very sneak, very, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Help me out. Um, complicated. Complicated. That, that's so, a very complicated you, subject. Yeah, you all should know that this has been going on. This has been all going on all morning. morning. We were at. 
<laughs> intergenerationally very, and ideologically. This has been happening all weekend. Um, and again, I will leave it up to those who own identities that might be different from mine to articulate that, but I was simply saying that saying. to, <laughs> that for me to construct an identity and put boundaries on it based on my privilege and my power that someone has to convince me in an acceptable way about how they choose to move in the world is, is I think, hegemonic. I think it reconstructs a, a, a I dynamic. I think that's very that white. We, I think that's very she individualistic. She thinks it's very white. Yes, in, very individualistic. individualistic. This is why I think that. This is why I think that. Listen to me very carefully. A black trans person does not live the same life as a white trans person. That's right. The white trans person can move away from the shackles of race because even when they don't deal with race, People, powerful people in their communities are, are making sure that that's in place. And, but the black person who's a trans has to carry with them the marks of race and gender. And, 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 and they cannot shake off the marks of race. They cannot suddenly come with just the identity that they, because whether they choose to be black or not, the world looks at them through black eyes. They care through eyes that determine, through eye, eyes of the colored. And, and so we don't get a choice in many ways. That's a mythology. But I'm not even suggesting that one privilege is one. I mean, we've got the gift, we have the gift of intersectional, intersectionality, right? And so that presupposing, however, I still think within the conversation that people articulate their identities on, 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 on th that is fluid. We were talking about um, uh, sexual identity, where we're talking about uh, an identity of, of, of being trans, um, even beyond that. And so that's really what I was speaking to. Um, I, and I know, race, darling. and there are intersections and all of that, but that was but I point. think, But I think Thank we're on to something that we should really push <laughs> a little bit further, because I think that you can't say one, you can transcend one construct, but you, I mean, if a, black, if a white person said they were black and wanted to be black in the world, black people would get very offended by that. Let's be very honest about that. And the reason why they would be offended, why we would be offended, not they, I don't want to commit existential suicide here, but the reason why we would get offended is that they're, they're the marks of history. That, that we've carried certain things within us and we face certain consequences every day of our lives. And just because you decide that you want to suddenly be that, that doesn't make it so. Because along with being that comes certain his, comes a history, comes experiences, comes relationships, comes pain, comes suffering, comes victories, comes joy. And so you just are not free to just say, I'm going to be what I want to be, and, and, and not hear that history is essential in identities, that you're not made out of nothing. So. Then if you do that, then white people never have to bear the responsibility of racism, because they can say that who they are begins right now, and that they don't have to take the responsibility for enslavement, because that was not a part of who they are, and they choose to distance themselves and they choose to define themselves outside of that history. And that's what's problematic for me with, with that construct. Of course I believe that people can be transgendered, but I think that I would nuance it a little bit differently. I would nuance it so that there's a place for history to work out that tension between how one names oneself and, how, and the kind of life that one comes, the collective experience that one has inherited and what that means spiritually and psychologically in creating a human apparatus. I agree, and I hope ultimately we are moving beyond these, these categories and ways in which um, that limits humanity. Uh, but I think the first order, or at least given where we are, it's to be able to name and enunciate and any name, and that everyone can do that. I do have, I know that we're probably um, 
pressed for time to go on to questions mm -hmm. now. So we'll open it up the conversation for others. But to wait, join. I gotta defend myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, <laughs> when black people have don't confuse naming as a uni, as a monolithic construct. It's only white society that has used naming to oppress, naming as a way of, of, of isolating and setting people aside. When black people have chose, chosen to name ourselves, it's an act of resistance. It's a very different place to start the conversation with naming that has been used to, to make people small, to minimize when black people name, we're naming ourselves in relationship to our history as an act of resistance in claiming a larger space for ourselves than the space of being object. And so all naming is not the same for every, and so I, I think that it's really important when black politicians get in office, they don't use their power to isolate white people from the benefits of, of, of democracy. That's not, and so naming is not the same. And we've got to make those distinctions. Otherwise, we put on the backs of women, on the backs of people of color, a history that's not theirs. The patriarchs have done this, have used naming as a way of discrimination, isolation, dehumanization, and depersonalization. And we have to make a distinction. I don't think my mother did that when she says I'm black. That's not what she meant to claim her color. She didn't use it for that. It was a way of humanizing blackness in a world that where black was not human. And that's a very different starting point. Have I defended myself? Yeah. <laughs> I have um, a feeling there are people in the audience who would like to jump in. <laughs> so let's hear from you, please. God, I wish I had that kind of energy. <laughs> um, I feel I shouldn't really ask a question because I had the wonderful benefit of being in your class this morning, but um, thank you so much for all you've said. I wonder if I could just take to something different which you said on, um, in your conversation with Krista Tippett, which was that you talked about losing your religion or perhaps your faith when you, um, I think when you left home, I guess. Um, but you found it again. Would you mind saying a little bit about that, what happened to you, and then how you rediscovered it? Well, it was really, it, it happened in stages, to be perfectly honest. The first stage for me was on a demonstration, meeting violence for the first time, state sanctioned violence, mm -hmm. and having grown up on black folk theology in the Exodus story, I expected God to just come out of the sky on a chariot and smite those policemen dead. <laughs> and when that didn't happen, I thought, gee whiz, <laughs> is God dead? And so I began, and, and so from that point on, I, I went away from a spiritual analysis to a Marxist analysis. Mm. And I saw the whole world through economic eyes. Mm. And I became very impatient as youth are and rightly so, because you should be patient, impatient with old, I mean, with the status quo. And so I became impatient and I would be horrified when black people would begin mass meetings with a prayer or a song. I couldn't understand why we couldn't just get down to the business. Why is it that we had to be so ridiculous, so, so such a religious fanatic that we had to pray before we went out in the street. I wanted to get going with it. And so I began to look at religion as an opiate of the masses, right? And, and I didn't understand the difference between religion and, 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 and spirituality, that I didn't understand that the work that we were doing was spiritual work that was rearranging our relationships with God, each other, and all aspects of creation. And so it took me years of being a Marxist to, to, I struggled with that for years. And then the woman who locks my hair had a, has a daughter and she was a crack addict. 
And she came in one morning after hustling all night. And I wanted to say something to her. And Marxism didn't seem large enough or deep enough to speak with, to, the, to the crisis of the spirit that I saw operating there. So I could only remember what my mother would ask us when we hurt ourselves as children, when she would say, tell me, where does it hurt? And so that's what I asked her. And that opened up channels in her life that she had never spoken before, incest, mm -hmm. all kinds of violations, all kinds of aspirations, that all kinds of assaults on her, on the, on her inner and outer self. And I realized in that moment that I needed for my own life a larger language to talk about the work that I felt called to do. And that's when I began to really, and I also was watching a Holocaust movie. And there was this woman who, despite everything that happened to her, she never lost her sense of hope in humanity. And I knew that that had nothing to do with Marxism. And so that's, that was my journey, a journey towards wholeness, um, a journey towards not being fragmented, where I made a connection between my inner and my outer world, where I began to reconnect with the songs that had been so important to me as a young person, with the prayers, without a sense of disdain. And finally, the ultimate experience for me was when Martin Luther King came to Lowndes County to preach. And we snick, we were called the shock troops, the shock troops, and, and we did all the, the soldiering work out there in the fields. We took the hits every day. We lived in a community in Shack called Freedom Houses. And we were angry with Martin Luther King because we thought he was an old man who was only 30 something. We thought he was an old man who was getting all the credit and, and being the superstar <laughs> while we were doing the hard, nitty gritty work. So he was coming to Lowndes County and we said, Stokely, and we got together, Stokely said, okay, when Martin comes, that's what he called him, when Martin comes, we're going to show him something. We, the, the rest of those idiots can jump up and say amen and that crazy, but we're just gonna sit there and stare at him. So our direct quote, our action was to stare at Martin Luther King and not say a word. And so Martin Luther King began to speak he began to, t and it got better and better. And the next thing we knew, the black folk theology came out at us and we were on our knees shouting louder than anybody else. <laughs> and and that's, the, that's the connection. So even though we denied it, it was deep in us. And Martin Luther mm -hmm. King had the gift of bringing that out in people who had even tried to repress it. Yeah. I just wanted to thank you for bringing up that very complicated problem that you brought up. And I think, and, and I know it takes courage to do that. And I think it is a really interesting, and I, I don't want to completely engage it right now, because <laughs> we, we can go on forever. <laughs> But I do think that you're bringing up a really, really, really important problem. And, it, and um, the one thing I would say is that, that I would resist from part of what you were saying was that you, know, you either are something or you're not something. That's where I'm not so sure that that's true. Because I think the, when you were asking us to you know, come up with something new that you haven't seen, the new things that are coming up are in the spaces in, in between and the strange combinations, you know, and people, people indeed do walk away from their history and heritage. Not completely, you're right, they can't completely, but you can to a certain extent. And some people can do, do it more than others. And some people find it coming back to them later on. And, you know, some people are immersed in their history more than others. But I, I believe it's a negotiation between the naming and the culture side. And, and, and those are two very different things. I'm, I'm, 
I'm speaking out of Buddhist philosophy. Uh, I know, and, and, I hear and, you, and I'm thinking about it. But, but do you think that naming stands outside of cultural references? Sorry? Do you think the process of naming is outside of culture? Outside of culture? It depends on how you define culture. But okay. I, I was taking the first part. So the, the, what you said earlier on, which was I believe was a really amazing thing, but you were talking about the brilliance of your parents and your ancestors. And, and the kind of agency that they were creating, which was, you know, which is, you know, a really huge, and it's true, very amazing and very brilliant. But I believe that those kinds of ways of forming yourself and forming your children and forming your community can't be done with a snap of a fingers. It's a, it's a long-term process that I consider to be different in kind than naming I mean, naming, you, you can break down this dichotomy too, but naming is different in that there's, there's a shortcut in naming. There's, there's a power in naming, but there's also a shortcut. And, and they're different, I believe they're different kinds of things, and they need to work with each other. That's, that's just my su I'm suggestion. I'm think about that, but my first response on the, just a visceral level, and it's probably, I, I, I'm gonna think about that because you raised some good points. But I think that the reason, the way I would look at naming is a question that black people used to ask young people when we would bring children home to play with us. The first question that our parents would ask them, child, who are your peoples? Who do you belong to? Whose name, whose history are you carrying? What family do you belong to? That became a reference point for placing, for placement. And it was not a bad placement, but it gave that, that, that person a form and, and a frame of reference. So I think that when I talk about naming, I'm referring to that question that was essential to, to black life. In other words, what's your history? And I think that it's, it, it would be traumatic for me as a black person to walk away from my history because the history of black resistance the history of my black parents, the history of my counterculture of education, my history, the authenticity of my history is that which has saved me. I think I have less baggage with my history than black people not participate. White people might have a desire to walk away from their history, to, to, to release themselves from the burden of that history. But I, as a black person, need my history in order to be whole in a society that says that I am less, that I have no history, that I have no past. When I was a student at, his, at Princeton, I would get in trouble all the time in American history because part of the historical debate was that black people had no past. I, that was seriously a part of the historical debate of a university like Princeton, that I would have to sit there as a human being and debate whether, and offer evidence to show Basil Davidson. I couldn't quote my mom and my daddy. I had to quote Basil Davidson, who authenticated the fact that I have a history. And so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking deeply that history means different things for different people. And for African Americans, history has been the fountain of our survival. And it's very different. And I, don't, I think a black person who walks away from that is a black person without roots. And you cannot survive as a black person in this society without having roots. You, you just can't spiritually survive. You will be not grounded. And so that's why I take the position about history that I take. Thank you so much for, for being here this evening, and thank you all for inviting the community to this forum. 
I'm from the Harvard Kennedy School, and I'm actually one of the advisors from the conference that we held this weekend with the Black Policy Conference, and it was entitled. Could you talk a little louder, please? Sure. Can you hear me? Is this better? I have it. Oh, you have the earpiece in. So I was just saying thank you so much for being here, and thank you to the, the Divinity School for inviting everyone in the Harvard community to be here. I'm from the Harvard Kennedy School, and I'm an advisor to the Black Policy Conference that took place this weekend. And our conference title was Why We Can't Wait. And so when you mentioned um, where do we go from here, mm. from chaos to community, it made me just think about the relevance of Dr. King's messages from the Civil Rights Movement. But my question actually is based upon something that you started the conversation with, and it mesmerized me. Mm. You talked about the spiritual genius of your parents. Mm. And when you said that, it sparked something inside of me because it made me think about my own experience. And I didn't understand what to name it, but when you said it, I said, yes, that's what it is. It's spiritual genius. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I wanted to know if you could tie that into the question that was raised about the prophetic nature that both Fannie Lou Hamer and Martin Luther King exercised. Because I see a connection between the spiritual genius which everyone doesn't have, it's a part of the black folk tradition, but I do see a connection between the prophetic word or prophetic act or prophetic way of being. And I'm wondering, for, for those of us trying to do religious and theological work, what are the elements mm -hmm. of that spiritual genius that we, what elements do we need to be mindful of as we think about being prophetic and mm -hmm. trying to emulate the essence of what's embodying that spiritual genius tradition, what should we be thinking about and how should we be thinking about it as theologians and as religious scholars? Mm. I think that some critical words that might lead us in that direction are a yearning. Um, not, being, not being able to be satisfied with things as they are and your very survival depends on imagining things in different ways. So I, I think, and, and, and not only that, but to be able to not only imagine it, but set aside, to, but, but go about building it when there's no evidence, faith, when there's no evidence. You cannot have a prophetic voice without faith. And so I think that our parents had faith, a living faith, that if you educated generations mm -hmm. of black children, it would ultimately advance the race and advance democracy and preserve our rights and liberties. And they were doing that in the heat of segregation when there was no evidence that any of what they would do, because all evidence said that that would never happen because the Southern Empire was an iron chain empire. And no one ever thought that it would ever fall. So for these peasants to imagine a world and have enough faith in the face of what seems to be evidence to the contrary, that's what a prophetic voice is to me. The absolute insistence on this vision. I, I think you have to have that kind of strong living faith. The other thing that I think a prophetic voice has to do is to see the capacity, to see the potential for people to be not where they are today, but where they can be tomorrow. To imagine the best in people. And you're calling, although it sounds harsh, you really are calling out the best in people. That you have more faith in what people can become than what they believe they are. And I think that's what a prophetic voice is. It's really, so that's what, and I'm trying to think of what else I think is a prophetic voice. It's not about predicting the future. It's about imagination, imagining. Oh, and I think you have to have a love for the people of God. You cannot have a prophetic voice that's um, shaped in hatred and over and against a theology. So there has to be an element of reconciliation. Mm 
Do y'all ever sing? <laughs> Purpose sing. I'm, what do you sing when you sing? What kind of freedom songs does your generation sing? Depends on who you're asking. Okay, I want to hear, can, before we go, may I hear a freedom song? James. 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 <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we have one more? I know the microphone went to one more. Well, it was, so it was kind of a question and then a song. It was kind of a concluding question. For those of us who didn't have the benefit of being part of this wonderful conversation through the weekend and all of the classes that you participated in, but came just today and feel like we've come in in the middle of the conversation, I'm wondering, because I don't even know for sure what the right question is to ask, if there is something you came to Harvard Divinity School on your heart or in your mind that you would like to say that nobody thought to ask you. I wanted to give you a chance to say that so that we could take that home in our own hearts and minds. I brought my 13-year-old today and I want to take something home. Yes. I wanted to say to young people that part of the gift of youth is not to be saddled down with status quo responsibilities and weight. Uh, saddle down, throw away your credit cards. <laughs> you can't indulge in fighting the system when you owe your hearts to the country's company store. Push the boundaries of your intellect. Don't be afraid to speak out, have passion, argue the way we argued, and end up <laughs> loving each other at the end of that conversation. Do not capitulate I'm not asking you to run rampant. I know there are rules that you have to follow, but I'm saying even within that reality, rage against the machinery of the status quo. Yeah, to be 19 years old and to be 52 in actions is a tragedy. Take, your, take this opportunity to become not only regurgitators, but the producers of knowledge. Write, think. Put those people in your Rolodex and draw on them and be audacious. Don't go through life so quiet. Quietly, don't. You're too quiet. I worry about your silence. I worry about your lack of passion. I worry about the fact that people tell you you have to be good and perfect at nine, 19. I was not good and perfect, I was rebellious. But and it was that rebellious spirit that got channeled. Once it got channeled, it went in a very, but without that initial rebellious spirit, I wouldn't have cut classes to join SNCC. And that was not a bad <laughs> thing, was it? I mean, so I really, really want to say to you, you're too young to be old. <laughs> you're too young. I want to see you have a little bit of bravado. And, even, and never be afraid to speak the truth for fear that you might say something wrong. If I can admit I'm elitist, don't be afraid that you might say something sexist or racist. Say it, because once you say it and someone tells you and you're willing to hear, that means that you leave being a larger person than when you came. Don't be afraid of being wrong. It's okay to be wrong. We're not perfect. And so I, I don't want you to be afraid to speak out. And never let anybody tell you that to work for justice is to be a superstar. There, there are no icons. The only icon in life is God. And when you build your, your life on your being large and somebody else being small, you've stepped outside of the ring of what you're doing in terms of justice. This little light of mine, you've got the light of freedom in you and you have to let it shine. And my ego should not require you to dim your light so that my light should shine. That's why I didn't get mad with Carlene. Because I, I think it's really important to really, to, to engage in that. To, to, and so that's what I would say to you. I wanna see you do something right, right. Don't wait to be 35 years old to write something. Write, think, 
be as courageous in thinking as you are in love affairs. <laughs> That's really important. That's what I want to say. I don't know who our song leader is going to be, so be thinking about it, song leaders. But um, Ruby, we just have a small gift for you to remember your visit to HDS in our 200th year. Um, we're so honored to Thank have you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me just say it has indeed been a pleasure and an honor, and I hope that you have understood that my responses have been grounded in love and with deep hope. I'm depending on this, your generation. I'm depending on you to take the ball a little bit further and to, and to help redeem the souls of this country. You're in a great position to do that. And so I hope that you understand that I come to you with a great deal of love and a belief in you and, uh, and standards. <coughs> love doesn't mean that I don't have high standards. And I have those standards. <laughs> and so let's see what you do with them. And you're not going to get away without singing a song. <laughs> <laughs> what about this little light of mine? Huh? What about this little light of mine? I can't tell you your freedom songs. <laughs> you have to say what your freedom songs are. That's my freedom song. Is that your generation? Is that your generation? No. Mm -mm. Oh, we're going to have to do another one. Um, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. So, that was great. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out today and being in this conversation with Ruby Sales. Thank you. Thank you.